So, good morning, Mr. Registrar. Could you call the case, please? Thank you, Your Honor. Good morning, Your Honors. Good morning to everyone in and around the courtroom. This is case number IT0588T, the prosecutor versus Popovich et al. Thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, all, the prosecu uh, all the accused are here. Prosecution, I only notice the presence of Mr. Markloski for the time being. And defense teams, I think uh, situation unchanged. Everyone is here, like yesterday. Um, uh, you prosecution has already taken six hours and 50 minutes. Uh, just for your information, I'm sure you know that. So let's uh, start, unless you have any preliminaries, but I don't think so. Good morning, Mr. President. Good morning, Your Honors and, and everyone. I want to begin in what will be a relatively brief presentation this morning. But I want to begin with some comments about the Corruption <coughs> case as per the directions of the court. First, on their brief, I read it and found it to be detailed and thorough, for the most part articulately written, but fundamentally flawed was full of unreasonable conclusions, misstatements, and misanalysis of the prosecution's case. We absolutely stand by, as we always have, the legal proposition if there are two reasonable interpretations of circumstantial evidence one in favor of the defense and one in favor of the prosecution, the court must go with the version in favor of the defense. But when you look at this brief, you really need to examine carefully their analysis and look at their sources because they're not reasonable. They're articulate, they're intelligent, but they're not reasonable can't go through all of them, I'll go through a few. And there's some fundamental flaws in the way they're coming at this. One example, they criticized the prosecution for concluding it in the opening statement that, or excuse me, in the trial brief, that Borovchanin was in Potocari in the early afternoon of the 13th whether 3 p.m., 3.30 p.m. is early afternoon or, or mid-afternoon. And this is what they say on that point. On page 60, paragraph 90. Now, I, I got a court agenda apparently last night at 10.30 that Ms. Stewart just put in front of me, so I'm hoping this isn't in their brief anymore. But this is what they said. The prosecution erroneously alleges in its pretrial brief that the, this visit, the visit to Podochari, was in the early afternoon of 13 July, citing the Petrovich video images as its source. This may seem like a minor factual error, but it would be naive not to view this as part of a pattern of minor misstatements designed cumulatively to create an entirely false impression. The prosecution is deliberately twisting facts to the trial chamber to create a false impression for you. Now, this kind of thing gets said. I usually call it false exuberance or over exuberance, excuse me. But it's a theme throughout. They give an example in my opening statement. Twist things. Say something I never meant to say and, t and tell you it's part of this pattern. Another example of this that I need to respond to is that in paragraph 163, they tell you that we withdrew two se second Chekhovichi witnesses 
and they call into question our, our motives for this and suggest that we, our claims regarding why we did this are specious. And they go on to say this, the prosecution's deliberate strategy of not calling direct eyewitnesses should not be lightly excused. The question is, why would the prosecution do this? What tactical advantage did they hope to gain? What aspect of their testimony might prove inconvenient or exculpatory so as not to outweigh the potential incriminatory value of the testimony? Is it safe to draw inferences based on the circumstantial evidence knowing the prosecution deliberately chose not to present eyewitness evidence? Paragraph 164. Well, please see our filings on this matter filed 23 January 2009 and 16 February 2009. These witnesses had become under the authority of the court, of the state court. They had stood on their right to remain silent. First they were indicted, then they were acquitted. Mr. Thayer, myself, Mr. Vanderpuri are licensed to practice law in the United States under the rules of our states in the District of Columbia. We are not, under those rules, allowed to use the force of process to call someone like this that is facing potential loss of their freedom. And we stated as much. Yet we're having this thrown back in your face, and, and they, want, they want you to imp imply that it's part of this, this continuing theme of theirs. I, I hope we don't see it in the closing argument. It's unreasonable. You can handle it, but it shows their reasoning is, is, is over the top, and we see that. Look at the way they've analyzed the two Kravitsa warehouse witnesses. Completely off the mark, completely unfairly. And it's not just the prosecution, as I, as I said, they state three times in their, in their brief, at paragraph 89, 101, and 186, something to the, along the lines that when Borov Chanan is in Podochari after 3.30 p.m., the evacuation was essentially or effectively over. They say that three times in those three different paragraphs. And if we look at PO 2986, it may come up on the screen, I'll take you back to part of that video that was shot by Petrovichus, which as we know, Borov Chanin was right there. It's a huge line of separated men next to a huge line of buses. This, he wasn't there for that long under his own words, a half an hour, 30 minutes. The time stamp seems to reflect that. So he's there during a crucial, crucial time period, not when it's essentially over. They base that on the statement of, of Van Dyne who said the, something about the large group of people is no longer there. Well, remember the large group, some 20, 30,000 people in a couple of photos. Well, that's true, but there is still a lot of work to be done. And that statement is just not reasonable that it's essentially or effectively over. He's there during a critical period, separations of the horror of what's going on. And he's got his cameraman with him who's editing out the various bits of horror that we know. In addition, I've got to go briefly into private session. Let's go into private session, please. So I want to just take you to very significant changes from the statement of Mr. Borov Chenin, which I'm sure you've carefully gone over, the statements that he gave to me over a, two different statements with several days in between. He's a very bright, very capable police officer, commander, that came into this well-prepared, this was not where he got picked up and, and, and 
and suddenly talked to in an interrogation room. And as we've stated out in the, in the brief, he had a, a very well thought out but flawed defense that under his version basically freed him of military responsibility and it went like this that he learned he was ordered by General Mladic in the early afternoon of 13 July so excuse me 12 July right before anything is really happening I believe in the in terms of the busing to take his units to Zvornik, not towards Zvornik, to Zvornik. When he told me that in the interview, to Zvornik, I asked him, well, where in Zvornik? And he said, Zvornik Brigade Headquarters. You can see as we cite in the brief, I was astounded by that because I knew that his units were stationed along the road. We'd had the first public version of the Petrovich video for a long time at that point. And I knew that the critical point that was needed <coughs> at that point at 12 July was that road, not Zvornik. But he continued to push that theme. And of course, he acknowledged that he was along the road on the 13th and came up with the story that as he set off, it became dark even though he said he set off at 4 p.m. And it was too dangerous for his troops, his Pragas, his tanks, to go up to Zvornik. They've been sending women and children along that route the entire day. The only dangerous, part, really dangerous part of that route at that point was between Konyevich Polye and the Drinyatsha River. A few, a few kilometers that Borobchanin's army couldn't manage. Well, it was an absurd comment. And then he tried to explain that he, so he got stuck and had to stay on the road. And then he said he got orders from the MOOP. So now he's under the command of the MOOP. And I said, well, are you under the command of the army? And he goes, no. So he's not under the command of the army anymore. And then he comes around, oh, no, I am for combat purposes. So he's, he's stuck in this terrible place he's gotten himself in. Makes no sense. However, he has now put himself with orders into Zvornik, saying that he's now left Dushkoyevich and his other units behind no longer in command. And he's not working or doing anything with the army. He's stuck in limbo along the road. This was his defense, it's laid out perhaps more articulately in our brief. Well, now the brief comes completely off that, as far as I can tell, and is now repeating what we see in his reports on the matter, that he is ordered by Mladic to go to the road and he takes his troop to the road, which means there's an acknowledgment, even though there's no evidence of it, that all of that material that he told me were lies. Well, it's obvious they were lies, so now they're agreeing. And unless they're not, there's, uh, we'll see that, oh, maybe the stories of, of being too dangerous to go to Zvornik and being blocked and all that is, is, is still at play but I don't think so. So this is a radical change, trying to make the story more reasonable. And at the same time, the story switches to, yes, he is I issuing orders to Dushkoyevich to take part in the evacuation, which, if you recall my interview, he doesn't want to have anything to do with Dushkoyevich after he leaves Podochari. That's Dushkoyevich. He's working with Momir Nikolic. I have nothing to do with them anymore. Now that's changed after testimony in this case that it's uncontroverted, no reason to lie. He's now acknowledging 
He's issuing orders to Dushko Yevich. There is no more indicia or indication of command than the issuing of orders. He stays in the Bratanats area on the 13th, the 14th, as does Dushko Yevich, both in Podocharya's troops and along the road. No question. He is in command of Dushko Yevich and his troops and in control of them. They make an amazing allegation, which Mr. Borovchin never made to me. As a military man, I can't imagine him trying to tell me this that, oh, yes, he was issuing orders. He was present in the area, but he was not exercising command or control over this unit. Nonsense. That would violate the rule, the law, common sense. It's completely unreasonable. We see him in Podachari on the 13th when this awful stuff is happening and his commanders are on the field separating people. And also is in his interview when we got to the road. And we're playing the video and asking him about who these men are. He's telling us, oh, the people that are capturing the men, those are, those are Milan Lukic's men. Those are army that are, that are taking the, the men and, and guarding them. My guys are on the road. We're not really involved. And then he, he makes this comment, I cannot exclude the possibility that one or two or more of my men were involved. But he does not want to have anything to do with the capturing and the detaining um, or the dealing or the coordinating of those men in the interview. It's clear as a bell. And now, at paragraph 166 of their brief, they're acknowledging that his men are taking part in the capturing and the detaining of these men. They even go on to say that his commander, Chuderich, was coordinated with Momir Nikolic, who we know is also going up and down the road at this day, coordinating those captures and those detentions. So this is another radical change where they're looking to the common sense view of the evidence and undercutting significant parts of the statement of their client. <coughs> it's an attempt to make it more reasonable. But of course, how does that affect the overall package? It makes it less <coughs> credible. The overall package less credible. And as we'll get to a little bit later, from the version that a Muslim soldier took a weapon, shot a Serb moop person, the Serbs grab the gun away, burned his hands, and then fire back which we agree happened. You can see that, as we said in the brief from the health records, that happened. But Mr. Borovchinin's version is after that, Milo Stupar reports to him that it, Milan Lukic's men fired back, committing mass killings. There's no suggestion of a two-part legitimate escape attempt that they're talking about now in their brief, and then a systematic murder happening later on that night. Doesn't get into that at all, and I'll tell you, you know, I'm sure you'll agree with me on that. The one person in this courtroom that knows what happened at the Kravitsa warehouse that night is Lubisha Borovchinin, and he had the ability to tell me that, or tell us that. He didn't, it had been a legitimate escape attempt. Could have very well told me, and he should have. But 
now the story has changed, and I'll get into the support of that story a bit, a bit further. Let me go to a couple of conclusions that the defense make. Page 23, paragraph 41. They say, even if Borovchinin somehow surmised improper coercion was underway, he's referring to Potachari, his only viable course of action by that stage was to alleviate the humanitarian situation. Well, let me tell you what his viable options were. <coughs> and this is important because I'm sure in our lifetime we're going to see international troops in this situation again, refugees coming in. The Geneva Conventions are clear. When you know a crime is afoot, and he must have known the intentions to th toss those people out, he should not have been involved. When he heard about the assault to go into the enclave, he should not have been involved at all. He'd, if he'd walked away or refused, he wouldn't be here today. Now, as we've always said, part of this assault had a legitimate aspect. So let's give him the benefit of the doubt. Even though he knows what's going to happen when he gets there, that they've focused on, this, on the population, and they're going to toss him. He, he takes part in going through the minefield, and he takes control with the VRS of Potochari. That by itself still leaves him time to get out. Does he get out? No, he doesn't. He could. He did not now, once he found out and was aware that this and was ordered to take part in the separations and the forcible transfer of the population. It is not the prosecution's position that he had <coughs> to prevent, try to prevent that. He did not have the military capacity to take on Mladic and Mladic's VRS. I don't expect that. I don't think the Geneva Conventions expect that. But what they do expect, and what he knows by training, is that he should not had been involved. He could have done what the ICRC did in Jeppa, Srebrenica, and just refuse. Just don't take part. He could have also done what the Dutch did. He could have helped the Dutch. He could have put a security cordon around to look after those um, people, those civilians. And maybe those nine guys wouldn't be dead, and the tenth person that was shot up against the wall, and the other horrors that happened wouldn't have occurred if he'd helped. Van Dyne and Rutten and Costard, and made it clear to them, hey, I don't agree with what's going on. I'm going to help you. At the very least, keep his men from separating people. You recall Van Dyne. His men were separating people from the first moment of the, on the 12th of July, and it went all the way through the 13th. Mendelev Juric was taking part on that. We see him on the video. The testimony was absolutely clear. He did not have to do that. And when he did, he was substantially assisting not only in the forcible transfer, but clearly under any reasonable evaluation of this. By the end of the 13th of July, he must have known that these men are going to be killed. And so by continuing to command his men in the process of the separation, he is substantially contributing to the murder operation. And follow the men that his men have separated. They go to Bratanats. He leaves them in Bratanats. He doesn't protect them ever, even though he knows of the murder operation on the 13th. 
threatened after Kravitz. Should he have disarmed the soldiers? Well, we don't have any beef with the idea of disarming the Dutch soldiers in the armed combat situation or as they're approaching. But once they're inside the, the confines of the area around Potichari and the Dutch soldiers are trying to protect these masses and they're of no threat whatsoever to um, the Serb forces, there's only one real reason they're dismantling the Serbs are dismantling the Dutch is to make their job to do the separation and forcible transfer easier. That's the problem here. Not, not uh, taking their weapons pursuant to the assault. I have no major disagreement with that. He could have also gone up his chain, Goran Saric, his commander, and said what was going on and reported it. He could have gone to Tomislav Kovac, the ministers, the assistant minister. Miroslav Darinich could have gone to Darinich, who had a connect with, at this time, with Karadich. Darinich recognized that there was no screening going on, that this was a wholesale grabbing of both men, old men, boys, and able-bodied men without any screening to determine whether or not they were war criminals or able-bodied. Darinich even recognized that. Look at his testimony. He didn't go to any of those people. He should have done those things as a commander. The Geneva Conventions require them. They ask the question, I'll give you my answer. They also say, the prosecution has not shown that Borov Chanin was animated by any other intent than to assist in the evacuation. Now, I won't reiterate all the involvement of this horrible process that he was involved in in the separations. But I will remind you, if you want to look at intent, look at his false statements to me, insisting that Yevtich, Yevtich were taken away from him, insisting that he was just visiting Podochari to take care of a Sit bus situation on the 13th. His false statement saying he knows nothing about the separations. He's lying to me about that because he knows that these are all crimes that he is involved in and his men are involved in and it shows a consciousness of guilt. That shows his intent. He also acknowledges now that he, his units are working closely with Momir Nikolic, Radoslav Yankovic. Of course they are. They're doing the same thing. And remember, it's a, we have a clearer picture now that he's acknowledging he's taking part in the detentions and the capturing of the, uh, of the men uh, in Sandici. Because remember what's going on in Sandici? The same thing that's going on in Potocari. They're stand, asking people to stand up, anybody born after a certain day, and they let those little kids, some of them, off and they, and they allow them to get on the buses. So Borov Chanin's unit and his people that he's fully aware of because he's up and down that road are separating, <coughs> in this case, the kids. They're taking IDs. They're not taking any names. They're not giving them any food. They're not giving them any medical. Horrible things are going on. The people that we see on stretchers, remember the forensics, the, they found stretchers in, in Glogova. Do you think that the people, that the Muslims that came out on stretchers uh, were carried all the way to the Kravitsa warehouse? No. There's evidence in this case that shootings were going on and killings were going on in Sandici. So the same things that are going on in Kodachari <laughs> are going on in Sandici. He is under the command. He is commanding the bulk of those units along the road. He's commanding a significant part of the units in Potochari. It's the same thing. He's trying to rely on this, this dog that just will not fight, that the security officers are commanding. The security officers are commanders, that Momir Nikolic and Radoslav Yankovic have, are commanding this thing. Well, I hope you can put this to rest. I will stand up 
for the accused security officer on this point. The difference between their criminal responsibility and the responsibility of the commanders is immense. It's not even close. Our visceral reaction of the men that are organizing the killings is, 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 is visceral. It's, it's, it's like we hate those local drug dealers that are involved in the killings, but the Harvard grad that's bringing in the cocaine on his Learjet is harder to get a handle on. His kids are in law school. So don't aggravate the case against the security officers. The real responsible guys for this are the commanders. Of course the security officers have responsibility. But there's always going to be people to take the security officer's job. The commanders are the ones that are going to really have the ability to stop this. Don't buy into their argument. Okay, now, Kravitz, I want you to, I don't want to play that, that body video again, but I do want to give you an exhibit that is a panorama compilation so you can get a, a one picture view of of uh, what Borok Chanin and Petrovich saw as they drove by. I've given this to um, the Borok Chanin yesterday and Ms. Stewart, if you could pass out this to, to everyone. Um, I think it's easier. It doesn't really come out very well. I'm, I don't, well, it may come out in the video, but I would prefer that everybody just have this. I may or may not want to refer to it at various times. Now, in their brief and in their opening statement, they asked uh, a couple of good questions to the prosecutions, to the prosecutions, a couple of questions that need to be answered. One of which is, why on earth would Borovchin take Petrovich around with him filming Podochari, filming the road, and certainly filming Kravitsa. Why on earth would he do that if he was actually part of this? Well, one of the answers is very simple. He received, as he told me, a written order Judge uh, Kwon has uh, raised an important issue. Have you given a copy to uh, the accused? Uh? I would trust defense counsel to have done that, um, but we have copies for the accused as well. He has a copy, Mr. President. But all the accused should have it, though. Okay, uh, thank you. And thank you, Judge Boyd. We, You can proceed. Thank you. So the question of why, why the journalist? Well, as he, he told me in the interview, page 51 to 52, it, that he received a written order from Goran Saric to take Petrovich with him. Well, there's one reason. He's following orders. Also, we know from his stunt on the 12th in front of the cameras, propaganda was very important for the Serb cause. They needed heroes. They needed to be re to report back that there were men in uniform doing their job for the cause. And so they needed journalists they could trust to shoot film, they could trust that they could come back and play. Well, they trusted the wrong journalist. Because we see, even before Petrovich gets involved, Borg Chanin is handing out cigarettes to children, but we also see in the back petrified Muslim men. And it's part of 
uh, an arrogance, uh, a stupidity as well as the propaganda effort. People committing crimes make mistakes. This was a stupid mistake on their part to be doing this, as he fully understands now. And for why he would have taken him and not done something about it to the actual Kravitsa killings? Well, having your men suddenly shot and killed by a Muslim when your men are supposed to be doing the executing, that, make, that may make you forget immediately what exactly is going on as you rush down there to take care of the problem. And you have your trusted person who is there to edit out any issues. Well, there was a lot of editing going on in that movie. There are 24 seconds of the film shot at the end, which should be, if you look at the testimony of Tomas Boastic on this, there's 24 seconds of a blackout and other items played that should be that section right after the bus in the last little open room that gets cut. 22, 24 more seconds. I wait for the phone call that that material gets found. A second good question was why would Borovchin, if he was guilty, bring the OTP, the Petrovich film, the section that was played over Studio B? Well, the answer to that is that was part of his overall strategy. He was betting that we had or would we eventually would get that film. It was shown on public TV. You can see the advertisement for a Rolling Stone concert under it. It was the best strategy to bring it to us and try to put his spin on it. But then why does he... Why doesn't he tell us that this is an escape attempt, a legitimate escape attempt that his men had to quell? We know it was his men that were involved, given with Army and others. His men were there. His officer was there. There's some very reliable hearsay in this case. Stupar, at 15 July, told the group at the meeting of the burned hand story and said his men the MOOP, and Army as well, fired back and killing everybody. It's very reliable hearsay, as well as the other secondhand evidence and other evidence that we've laid out on our brief. We don't discount that there were Army there. Where there's one Red Beret, the special unit, there are other Red Berets. Red Berets are the the one disciplined unit in the Bratanats Brigade that would be expected to be at the executions. So this was part of his strategy. And he's come off, as we've said, that first statement to me in par as part of that strategy, to try to make it make more sense. It's a continuing effort, a continuing strategic way of avoiding his responsibility. Now, I've spoken briefly about Mr. Borov Chanin and his control of the road on the 13th. That is in the brief. I think that is clear. Yes, there will be some Army people at the Kravitsa warehouse. We don't find any army folks in Sandici or along the road, and the, and the documents indicate this is a MOOP operation. Borovchanin, his tanks, his two anti-aircraft, his mortar platoon, his soldiers from the various companies, they're the ones that are there. They're the ones that are in control. They're the ones that have the power over good and over evil. Paragraph 189, where the defense acknowledged that Tudorich would have coordinated with Momir Nikolic about the closing of the road. This is also would allow us to infer that Momir Nikolic is 
coordinating with Boros people as well, not just the MOOP and Koinevich Polier, which of course would be in close communication with Borov Chunin's units. And recall the afternoon of the 13th, as we get closer to the warehouse situation, that Mladic and his senior officers are at the Sandici Meadow and for the first time really see the large number of prisoners that are there. This is after an organized execution, the Yadar River, a bus and an execution squad was used, where Serska Valley likely started on the 13th with three buses, an excavator. And I'm sure the orders and look came out at about that time that these men are to be killed. And that warehouse was right there, and they figured that out. Okay, so we have Borobchan in control of the road. We have him coordinating with the army. We have Mladic and the group passing through. I think we can definitely infer they gave some orders. Let's see how far we can take this inference. You've got to look at everything that happened that day before you can make the inference. Well, as you know, Petrovich recorded the video and we got snippets of the radio conversations that Borov Chanin is having with his men. One of them is stopping the traffic along the road. Now, if you evaluate that, that, and you look at the timestamps, which the defense agree are accurate, a timestamp appears at 1649, I believe. And then shortly thereafter is the order to, for Tudorich to close the road. And when we add up the time shot in the video, and the travel time and the cuts, it, he cannot have issued that order to close the road before about 1654. So it's after 1655, we believe between 1655 and 1700, he issues the order, Officier Boer, close the road behind your back. Now we know that happened because um, Pepich, his officer Pepich says uh, to Tudorich, Officier, uh, that he gets orders to close the road. And he does that. He's not great with times, but we clearly see. We hear, we hear the order, and we see how it happens. And as you look back at this, when you evaluate it, you'll see that the Muslim men must have been in the warehouse, or almost in the warehouse, giving the benefit of the doubt, when the order to close the road was made. And I'll, I'll get to how you can figure that out. It's in the brief, but this is, is, can be complicated. The other place where we can go to time is we know from the Bratanats Health Center that the first soldier that's wounded in the burned hands incident, as we call it, gets to the health center at 17.30 hours, at 5, 5.30 p.m. He gets shot through the arm, which can be a very dangerous, unlike television, a, a, a shot through the arm with a high velocity rifle can, can cut your artery and kill you in, in no time. So he is going to be, we can infer fairly that after he is shot, he is going to be taken to that health center as soon as possible. It's a, about 10 minute hurried drive from Kravitsa to the health center. So if he's checking in at the health center at 5.30 p.m., his shooting incident, the burned hands incident, happened 10 minutes, maybe 15 minutes earlier at 515, 520. 
And that's about the time Borovchenin arrives, shortly after that incident, 515, 520, thereabouts. Because he hears it immediately. He's in Sandici, according to the video. He says he's a little bit farther away, but no matter what, he's going to be coming there as quick as possible. And there's no way to get him there less than about three minutes, no matter how far he is. So he's getting there shortly after it happened. 5.15, give or take. And when he gets there, we see this. Many bodies piled up. So we know something horrible has happened in the time between he closed the road and he arrives. And he had to have closed the road after 1654. And there's dead bodies at 515, 520 thereabouts, lots of them. Now, I had said before, I think in a question, that it was our position that the doors that you see on that, on that warehouse were open. And that the way the soldiers were acting meant that everyone in there was dead. Well. We have looked at some of the, well, all of the conclusions in the Borov Chenin brief, and not all of them were bunk. This particular conclusion of theirs that these were closed doors, we carefully reviewed and we agree with. You'll see other. If you look at this very carefully, you'll see other pictures shot through those open doors and the windows in the back of the warehouse cast an eerily similar look as this photo. But we agree, and I have offered to enter an agreement of facts for, for the record for you, that these doors are closed. So we cannot now conclude as easily as we could before how many people are dead, except that group of 15, 20, 30 that we see scattered all the way from one side of this photo to the next. That's a lot. And as I read the Borov Chunin brief, they fundamentally agree with our times. They leave a little more space, but they fundamentally agree that the, the shootings happened between and 5.30, and it's necessary for their new defense that this was an escape attempt. <coughs> so the question now, the big question that we get to when you can go through this and you listen to my colleague is, <coughs> is this all there is? Is this an escape attempt? Or is it a full execution in process? Well, to answer that question, you go to the two survivors. They answer the question. It's why the Bo and the, and, and the Borovchun team understands that. It's why they attacked the particular survivor, the one in the west side, or as they call it, the right side of the warehouse, so vociferously. Because under his testimony, he goes into the warehouse. His group is the last group. The other side has already filled with the other survivor in his group. And the last man that comes in and packs that warehouse doesn't have a place to sit. And the Serbs open fire on him and open fire on everybody. And the shooting goes on and on and on until nightfall. Now, that is not an escape attempt. It's not a, the burnt hands incident. That is an organized and systematic execution. Now, what, is, what support do we have for that? Well, that's one Witness 157, excuse me, 156. Witness 
111 was at the other end of the warehouse. He is there. And then suddenly outside the warehouse, he hears automatic gunfire and all hell break loose. He's not exactly sure where it's coming from, but it's close by. He hears automatic weapon fire. And crucially, crucially, he hears hand grenades. You don't use hand grenades to quell a burned hands escape attempt. When your soldiers are all around you, you're not going to pull a hand grenade and, and, and toss it at the guy that's got the weapon. So if hand grenades are used in the early part of this execution as described by 111, it's a significant indication we have an organized execution. What other evidence do we have of hand grenades? Well, Borov Chenin himself in the interview tells us that when he hears over the radio that there's something terrible's happened, he hears detonations in the background. So, that's, and then when we see him on the Petrovich video walking around Sandici, this is after he has closed the road. Listen, listen to the tape. You can hear automatic weapon fire and explosions. This is shortly after he's closed the road. Celic, this Serbian MOOP guy that's there, that sees the column walk by, also hears hand grenades at this point. There's no hand grenades used to quell some minor burned hand situation. The use of the hand grenades and the other heavy weapons, look in that side of the warehouse, is a key and important and significant indication in this. And let me show you, a, you may recall the Nicholson video, um, which I believe is P0175. We've got a, an exhibit to show you. I don't want to show that whole video again, but we've got an exhibit that shows you where the hand grenade release handles were found around the warehouse. Several of these handles were found outside the two back windows. So more indications of hand grenades. Yeah, we've just taken, looking at, at this diagram, there was one grenade handle found at the end of the warehouse, right, and then a group of six in front of the area of one window and a group of four in front of the area of the other window. Now, I probably don't have the time to carefully go through the testimony of 156 and 111, but the only difference really of, of significance for your consideration is that after the shooting erupts, 156 says that it stops at nightfall, whereas 111 says it stops after a while. And, and then there's the left hand. Okay, I'm now at the Sorry. And then a half an hour later, firing erupts in his side. People come in and start shooting him, and that goes on and on and on. And he says it goes on intermittently through the night. And the big dispute here, their theory 
that there's a systematic organized execution that starts at night is based on their evaluation that 111 is saying that this execution on his side happened as night was falling at 8.30 or 9 o'clock because there is some indication that he's trying to figure that out and he says night is falling as far as he knows and so that would be 8.30 or 9 o'clock at night. Well, to buy that theory, it's not reasonable because witness 111 clearly says that a half an hour passed between the shooting that he heard on the other side of the warehouse and the time the shooting happened at his side. The question was asked, how much time passed between those two events, between the shooting outside and the shooting that took place when the soldier fired at you? Answer, I think that in a previous statement I said that, but I will say that again. It's no problem. About half an hour passed between those two events. That's it. 7060, 19 through 24. Then he says, firing in the East Room took place intermittently. It was already dark. Night had already fallen. And during the night, there were several breaks, and then shooting would erupt again. Now, they're founding their whole view of this on his conclusion that it thinks it's 8.30 or 9 o'clock at night because he thinks it's getting dark. Well, you've been in that warehouse trying to judge what time of day it is based on light when you're inside that dark warehouse is impossible. What he's absolutely clear on is that, it ha that his executions happen a half an hour after the ones that happened next to him. And we know those happened about 5 o'clock to 5.30 when the lull occurred. So theirs is not reasonable. It's based on a guy that is feeling it's getting dark. It may feel like it's getting dark. And they criticize 156. After gunfire erupts and hand grenades are thrown in, can you imagine what can you hear? Hand grenades go off that close to you and other large weapon fire, which there's evidence of, your head's going to be ringing like uh, unbelievably. Who knows? Who could perform such an experiment? So his ability or memory on what he is hearing and when he's hearing it is going to be flawed after the shooting erupts. You've got to give him that. Not so m much for 111 where it hasn't started yet. He hears the hand grenades. He hears the automatic weapon fire. And he also... Well, that's happening. The soldiers in, in his side are getting agitated, which of course you'd get agitated if you, you, know, you knew you were participating and your colleagues were participating in a mass execution next to you. But then look at the testimony of 111, who they say is reliable. He does, it, it, the guards say something, ah, you see what your people are doing, suggesting that they're the Muslims are attacking and that's what the gunfire is for. So look at all these things. It's the case within the case. And it takes very careful consideration. Most of it's in the brief on both sides. The defense supports their version by citing the evidence of Mevlud Norwich and two other MOOP officers. Moop to say that there's evidence that it happened in the evening. Well, what happened is after the shooting erupted, Borov Chanan is there. People are going to the health center. Remember the testimony, Chuterich goes to the health center, gets his hands bandaged up. Pepich eventually says he comes back from the health center and reopens the road. And it's not 
Tudorich that's reopening the road. It's Borovchin and that's reopening the road. He's the one that's issuing the orders, of course, and controlling this. So within a time that's hard to determine precisely, but if you look at the time Tudorich goes to the health center, he is checked in there at 540. So with the 10 minutes either way and the time it's going to take to get him dealt with, it's going to be at least an hour of him being looked after before he comes back and opens the road. And that's the time, a half an hour delay after Borovchenin arrives and they sort out their dead and their wounded. Then it begins again in 111's side of the warehouse, goes on for probably another half an hour, 40 minutes. And then that pretty much puts down the 1,000 people in the warehouse. Now, they're not all going to be dead, but they're going to be debilitated. The doors are closed on them. They're suffering a, a, a high-velocity gunshot in a crowded room with two to three people per square meter is going to go through multiple bodies. Constant firing of an automatic weapon is going to be able to dis kill and maim a lot of people. In some ways, it would have been better to torched the place, they would have died of smoke inhalation. Dying slowly of gunshot wounds, bleeding to death, twitching on each other. This doesn't have to take very long. We have to ask you to think about that. None of us are experts. Well, some of us are. But this didn't have to happen. It didn't have to take very long. So by 7 o'clock, we see the dead Red Beret, his name is Stanoyevich, is, his, his body is taken to the health center. So now we know that the, the MOOP has at least now had time to clean up a bit. There's hay on the bodies that are in front. There's a bus in front. There's an old car in front of 111. They're able to close that place up. They need to do that to get the convoys running. And so after an hour, an hour and a half roughly, of organized mass execution, this thing is bound up. And that's when Mevlud Norwich and two MOOP guys come along, and they're not going to see anything. Yes, they hear gunfire. There was intermittent gunfire throughout the night, I'm sure, on both sides of the warehouse, killing people as they moaned or stuck their head up or tried to get out or ask for water. We've seen that in all the other executions. main difference, well, let me go over 156's testimony. I'm sure defense counsel will. He says, in walking with the column, which we know happened, that he turns right, crosses into the crosses in front of the warehouse. There is no fence, according to that witness. Then he walks between a bus and the warehouse. Look at the picture. There's a bus. A bus was not given to him. He drew that, he drew that in, in his, uh, on his own before he even knew there was such a, a photo. And that he walked through that door that's behind the bus in the photo and over in the corner of the right-hand room near the river. And after that, he says he puts his head down, and we either don't ask him any more questions on that point or he doesn't remember anymore, but he does say that he goes out through the door he came in. And Mr. Ruiz, when he was talking about the warehouse, talked briefly about that witness, just a tiny bit of what that witness had told Mr. Ruiz. When Mr. Ruiz showed you the picture of the little guard room, and if we could show that picture to you briefly so you may recall it. Um, Stuart can, should be P02103, if I'm correct. 
This is the guard room that Mr. Ruiz talked briefly about, and he repeated a, a tiny snippet of what this witness had told him, basically that the witness had managed to get into this room and protect himself from the firing. Now, we have the witness testifying that he goes in the far right-hand corner, and we have Mr. Ruiz saying the witness told him he went into this room to protect himself from the firing. The fair inference from that, and we have the witness saying he went out through that door when he finally got out, the one that you see on the photo. The fair inference you should make is that the witness managed to get across sometime after those executions or even he managed to get through his way as he's trying to get out of those doors and manages to get into that room and hide. Not that he totally has two different stories, which will be the defense version, I'm sure. And the fence. The fence is a big part of their brief when they discuss this witness. There was no fence. This witness clearly said no fence. This is a, I'll show you a brief blurb about that fence. Um, if Ms. Stewart could hopefully, you may remember Mr. Nicholson's video. This is the only way to get you to see this fence and it, uh, you need to take a look at it because there clearly was a fence there in January of 96, this little fence that they lean up against this, these older bars that were, had been there a long time. But this is a, a little weak fence that could have easily been kicked over to allow these hundreds of Muslims into the warehouse. And you can look at the Petrovich picture. There's no fence there. That's when the witness is there. And we stand firmly behind the witness's recollection on that. And we'll show you, we'll show you the fence we're talking about so you can see it. And Ms. Stewart can run the video, maybe still it on the fence. Okay, there it is. It's the, the shorter one of the two. Um, that was in the wintertime pictures when Mr. Oez was first there. This is April 96. You, you will, you, if you look in the exhibit, you'll see the wintertime January. I th there's a shot of the fence too. Um, unfortunately, it's impossible to conclude from these photos whether or not Petrovich could have shot over the top of this fence, so that's why you don't see it in the video, or whether you don't see it in the video because it wasn't there. In any event, the witness is reliable. The fence could have been kicked over easily. There's no way they would have walked all this, this group around come into this circuitous route when they can kick over a little fence. So that is particular criticisms don't fly. Your Honors, that is a difficult subject. It's going to require patience to go through the material and double check everything I said, double check everything Mr. Gosnell said, but you don't use hand grenades to, to quell a burned hands incident. And these two victims are reliable. They also attack in their brief the reliability of the witness who testifies about the execution of the men left over at Sandichi Meadow. <coughs> it's one witness. Why on earth would he tell of an execution involving his unit? He, the facts fit. There are extra people at night at Sandichi. We find the same amount of people in a nearby grave. We can't prove beyond reasonable doubt those 
people are the same of the ones that he's talking about, but it's consistent. That execution would not have occurred without Borovchanin's approval and knowledge. Borovchanin has the conversation with General Kerstich later on that evening, about 8.40. Everything's okay, no problem. I start questioning him about that. He runs from that conversation. Look at the brief about that. He is lying about that conversation and going back and forth on it. It's an indication of consciousness of guilt, if I'd ever see any. He's in commanding those troops from the 14th. He doesn't go to Zvornik until the 15th. And look at what's going on on the 14th, too, to clean up the mess. It's still his unit's there. He's got to be held responsible for this. And very briefly, he's in control of the road. He's got the men and the manpower. Yes, there are small elements of the army, certainly not Milan Lukic's guys. Recall you the intercept. Milan Lukic's guys in the 13th buses broke down, and, and they're not around at the time that this is happening. And Bayara, two days later, is really upset. So there's no Milan Lukic men. That's mystery men. That's blaming every bank robbery on Je Jesse James because he's the bad guy in town. Completely false. But yes, there were Red Berets there. There would have been more than just one. There should have been Bratanot's brigade MPs. Momir Nikolic, who knows? When it comes to Kravitsa Warehouse and Momir Nikolic, I have no idea. Skweku Vanderpuye said, corroborate everything Momir Nikolic says. But Momir Nikolic says one thing you can bet on. He was part of this thing. He knew all about it. He was coordinating with the MOOC. He was all over the place. And now they're acknowledging he's, they're working with these guys. So when Borov Chanan understands what's going on here, he has got to stop it. He had the opportunity when he came back to the warehouse to stop it. He had the men, unlike in Potocari the day before, he had the men and the material and the means to stop it. He didn't. The Geneva Conventions require him to stop it. He is guilty of 7-1 for not stopping it. <coughs> Now, if I could, I'd like to go on to some brief remarks about General Pandurovich. If I could. As you know, the brief was extensive on, Pond on Pandurovich on both sides, and while I have the similar, I have many criticisms of their brief, look at it carefully. Their arguments are the arguments they've made from the beginning, <laughs> that they made from the witness stand. There's no mysteries, no real last minute curves. You've watched all that. You've seen it recently. You've seen me cross-examine General Pondorovich. I don't intend to take you through all that. There's no need to. But if I could get a break now, Mr. President, I could assemble my few remarks on, on General Pondorovich, and we'll come yes. back and finish this up. Sure. We'll have a 25-minute break. Thank you. Um, I'll rise for you. I'll rise for you, Evolving.